This is Duke University. By way of introduction, quote an article from, it was a profile of David Dunn in the New York Times in 2010. And this will tell you a great deal about what you want to know and why we brought him here. And, and we're really quite excited that he's here. Uh, I know it's almost inappropriate to be excited about climate change, but when you have someone who can uh, speak eloquently and uh, insightfully about it, and also talk to non-science folks like myself about it, and I understand what is really going on, it, it's well worth your time. So, to quote, uh, the, title, the article was, A Man Who Doesn't work his, Want His Work to Go Up in Smoke, by uh, Dina Marone. Dave Cleves wasn't raised to fight for the trees. The 62-year-old economist grew up in the cornfields of northwestern Ohio, at a time when the state's forests were routine, routinely felled to make way for farmland. But for Cleves, an outdoor enthusiast, identifying trees has always held more appeal than milking cows. Now Cleves is charged with charting the course for the Forest Service's response to climate change, helping America's forests and grasslands cope with ongoing threats exacerbated by global warming, wildfires, diseases, and pests. In five months on the job, he has laid out the broad strokes for the agency's next phase in its climate change response. He is only the second climate change advisor for the century-old agency, and he is the first to take the reins during the Obama administration. To some, Dave Cleves may seem like an unconventional choice to wrestle with this dilemma, since he is not a climate scientist. But with 25 years of Forest Service work under his belt, he shrugs off the lack of a climate focus in his background. He said, we have plenty of climate change ecological scientists and experts. My job is to put that together. And honing that recipe for decision making is his specialty. He is a former Oregon State University professor with a doctorate in economics specializing in risk management and decision making in forestry. With the Forest Service, he has routinely applied these, his tools of the trade to weigh relative risks and manage trade-offs wearing a number of hats. His newest job, however, is expected to be an unprecedented challenge. And he confided that is quite true yesterday at lunch with us. No, no shortage of challenges. Um, but it is expected to be an unprecedented challenge since predicting climate change's myriad impacts is fraught with uncertainty. As forest ecosystems climb northward, for example, deciding what strain of tree to plant in an area wiped out by wildfires is not just a simple matter of planting what lived there before. A hundred years from now, that area's landscape could look completely different. That, Dr. Cleves admitted, is daunting. But uncertainty and imprecise climate modeling do not mean the Forest Service can afford to be crippled by indecision, he has said. Quote, we can't be too rigid. We have to make the best decision with the information we have now. So with that as a way of an introduction, uh, it just popped in my head because I'm feeling my cell phone vibrate. So take a second to make sure your, your, your cell phones are off. We don't want to interrupt Dave as he's speaking. Um, and while you're doing that, or after you do that, if you'd put, uh, put your hands together and help, help me welcome Dave Cleves of the United States Forest Service. Let me, make, let me make sure this is turned on here. Can, am, I, am I mic'd? Do I have a live mic? I always have trouble with these electronics. When we, when we were having this little uh, issue up here, I at least had the outline lecture behind me in chalk, right? I was going to use that. <laughs> I was just going to fill in the part that says, and a miracle happens down in the corner here. And, uh, and then that went away, and I really began to get nervous here. So, um, so I can wonder a little bit, uh, W-A-N-D-E-R, so wonder. And, um, can you hear me in the back? Okay, great, great. Yeah, thank you for uh, inviting me when uh, Steve and Jamie invited me. I didn't know whether they were asking for a lecture or a historical artifact. You know, when you're around a while, you, you begin to wonder. 
And uh, I had forgotten all about this article in the New York Times in 2010. Uh, I came out of that, after I read that, I said, are they talking about me? And number two is that I thought, why do they always put your age in there? <laughs> <laughs> Reporters, I mean, they put it in there, it doesn't matter. They always put it in there. So my objective coming out of that article was to stay 62. <laughs> so that didn't happen. Uh, that is, uh, the time marches on, the climate marches on, and, and all this. Uh, what we're doing is we're passing out a little uh, timeline, because all, all historians, and I'm not a historian, and I'm you're looking at an administrator, and, if, and you know, if you hold me up to the light several different ways, I've had other jobs, but it, it hasn't been as a historian. But however, I, I, I like to deal with the concept of actionable history just as we deal with the concept of actionable. You're not hearing me? Try that. It, it's a little. The lavalier's not working? Uh, okay, so I just hold this. I promise not to sing. Okay. So, uh, so but I think one of, and what, where we'll end up today is, is a few reflections on the uses of history by administrators. Just as the use of science in decision making has gone through a number of different phases and has a certain process involved in developing it for decision making, I don't think that we're there when it comes to history. What do we use out of history? How do we, how do we read it? How do we generate our own history by asking the right questions at the right times of the right people, stuff that's even not written down? And I think we, uh, my perspective as a decision science is that we continue to make the same mistakes over and over because we don't really know how to bring history forward. So I think the concept of actionable history, because if you give history to an administrator, given all the other things that administrators do, they generally just sort of freak out because there's a lot of words in there, right? <clears throat> just oceans of words and, you know, put it to me in a form that I can bring into a, a, a rapid uh, e um, decision-making process, one that's uh, done in a pretty turbulent environment. So we, I wanna, that's where I want to end up. But I want to take us on a little journey here about uh, climate change and the Forest Service. And I'm so, um, and not that the Forest Service is the ultimate when it comes to climate change response and integration. Matter of fact, I, I have in the darker moments or at the end of the day some real problems with how the, the agency is or is not uh, adopting and integrating climate change, but that we are one organization. And most of you, especially young folks, uh, we all work in some form or fashion for an organization. So the, qu the question is, how do you take a, how does an issue like climate change, as big as it is, as multidimensional as it is, how do you integrate that and bring that into what you do in an organization? Where it's not just you, it's you and a bunch of other people operating in a kind of a institutional ecosystem there. So I want to use the <coughs> Forest Service as an example not as the, the center of the world, you know, the world revolves around the Forest Service. We have our, our issues and we certainly have our strengths. So I want you to look at us as kind of a, a case study here. So, and then I'm, I'm so comfortable that you put me right under the uh, chart of elements. <clears throat> I, mean, I mean, I walked in here and this is a real instant, and this is a real university room. It's got chalk and it's got the, the elements. I mean, this is what, so I'm gonna, if I can just climb up there and put forest carbon on C, you know, because it, you know, it's carbon's looking down, and we've kind of gone uh, when we're dealing with climate change. It's a lot of it's about forest carbon now, and you'd think that that was an easy thing for an organization to assimilate and integrate. It's not quite as easy as it seems. We'll talk a little bit about that. That's part of the longer the longer story here. So Jamie, when I what do I punch? <laughs> Try the mouse. The mouse. I, I don't like mice. <laughs> so I'll punch them. Okay. So what I, what I want to do is, is trace that process so far, climate change into the Forest Service and the Forest Service's programs. And it didn't just start and stop. There's a, there are a lot of antecedents and precursors and a lot of work that went on way before climate change became an issue that's critically important. And we need to, to honor that work and to recognize that it's there. And it goes way back before we started talking about climate change as an issue. And I want to describe some of the lessons that we've learned, talk a little bit about the future, about what this means for the future, because we're really not at an end point at all. 
None of us are when it comes to climate change. Uh, young folks can look at climate change in terms of career lives. Basically, as you look out over your career, you're going to be dealing with the impacts of a changing climate. You're not going to be, it's not going to be in front of you all the time, but we know, or we think we know, by the projections and by the evidence we receive now, that there's going to be lots and lots of changes. You're going to have to be, as a person, I think, and as a professional, and as an institution, adaptable to changes. I mean, basically, the new normal is that there's no normal, okay? So as you, as you move through your career, I think you need to, to, to think about that. And it's, and it's not, uh, climate change is not a religion. You don't have to believe in it or not. It's a changing condition for which we have some evidence that as a business case and as a professional case, it's important to recognize and to bring in. So my, my view in, in it is that as an institution, uh, in this case the Forest Service is an institution, we have an obligation in accomplishing our mission to deal with this change in context. We'll talk a little bit about some of the internal drama. And of course, all history is about drama, right? <clears throat> it's drama that started out as an ordinary day. And somehow, it contributed to, to history. So uh, welcome. We hope you make all kinds of history. And I want to just end by offering a few reflections as an administrator. <clears throat> We're into a period of rapid change, as if we haven't been into one before. But this time, it's driven in part now by a changing climate. I'm not going to get into all the, the um, impacts of a changing climate. You've got loads and loads of great material on that. I'm going to really talk about the administration's response or the organization's response to it. But if you have an organization that's somehow bound in tradition or bound in process that gives people comfort, they may, be, they may have their cage shaked a little bit under a changing climate. And we're beginning to see that in the Forest Service, and I think other organizations are seeing that also. So it's a, it's a, a, a real challenge. And, but so let's start with where we are right now. And then we're going to go back and talk about where we've been. And then we're going to go forward and talk about where we hope to be in the future. So right now, we, we need to under, understand a little bit about the climate change issue as an issue for decision making, because I know all of you are familiar with it as a scientific issue, but as a, an issue for decision makers, um, number one, it's become a political battle ribbon. It's become a way to label people, and it and that's, makes it very difficult to deal with. It's unfortunate that, that it came, that, came to be that way, but it's very difficult. We have a um, newsletter that goes out on climate change to th all 33,000 employees of the Forest Service every month. And it, it opens up then and responds to my website, the Climate Advisors website in the Washington office. And I get letters. And some of those letters are not very kind. <laughs> okay. And we, I've, I've saved some of the, the more acrid ones, you know, and, 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 and put on the wall, you know, hopefully. And uh, I'm going to have my own little retirement party, you know, and, and, and look at them and then say what I really wanted to say at the time. But, <laughs> but, but I've, I've, I've got some great, I've accumulated some great labels over time. I didn't even know I did those things, you know. <laughs> So, but, but as soon as you say climate change, to the point of making, to make a, a conversation work about a changing climate, you almost have to change the frame and the language that you use. There's a vast difference in the response you get when you say climate change from the one you get when you say a changing climate. So a lot of what we do is try to understand different problem frames to try to get the most productive conversations. We know that it, we're having many more extreme events, that the science is getting stronger, that we are having a changing climate, and that it's increasingly becoming a social and economic issue. And, and although the science, the economic and social science, really hasn't kept up yet with some of the impacts, we know that one of the big ones is the exacerbation of inequality. We know we have issues of inequality, social and economic inequality in the nation, 
And what's happening a lot with the impacts of climate change is that that is being exacerbated. There was an article in The Economist about four years ago that, that said basically the key to adaptation is being rich. Not a bad, I mean, I was that from The Economist? I don't know how much analysis backed that up, but the idea was that socioeconomically disadvantaged or underserved communities are going to have progressively more of an impact. They're going to have more and more of a problem from the impacts of climate change. We're going to get more and more into social and economic uh, implications of climate change, and yet it's really not on everybody's list. People don't enjoy seeing me come down the hall. Oh, there he is again. It's like Pigpen. What was that, the, the, the Snoopy guy? You know, they had the cloud over him? Okay, and now, oh, here he comes again. Let's run and hide from Davy, you know. <laughs> so, so, again, we've got to kind of reframe this. That a lot of people just, there's lots of other things to think about. Economics, if you want to think about politics, I've become kind of jaded about the whole thing after our little shutdown, showdown. Uh, but um, you have to kind of bring that topic up and get it to an, into the agenda. And I don't want to say force it, but you certainly have to kind of woo it into place. Uh, just last Friday, the president, uh, the Council of Environmental Quality, put out an executive order. So if we're talking about now, this is kind of where we are now. And under that executive order, it required all of the agencies to take the next step forward in preparing for climate change. This is straight out of the um, President's Climate Change Action Plan. It's mainly, it's almost entirely focused on what we can do in the administration because the relationship between Congress and, and the administration, as you, as you might have heard a time or two over the media, is not the best. So the president is focused on what we can do inside the administration. We don't need to get into the details, but the big piece of this that's coming directly from the White House is this third bullet down and indented here, is that they're asking the agencies to go into their policies and try to identify areas that detract from our ability to be climate resilient, whether it's about infrastructure, whether it's about our core mission, well, any parts of our operation. So that's going to set, as of last Friday, that's going to set the agencies to work going into some, and in some cases, really protected hallways <clears throat> in areas that we haven't been before. The Forest Service has been into some of this, but not all of it. So as I tell my staff, I have a staff of, of four, and they don't often wear camo, but they do some <clears throat> they they do some interesting counterinsurgency work inside the agency from time to time. I tell them, "Well, you got your work cut out for you. You better just uh, you know take another day off because then we're going to have to go we're going to have to go on the march again inside the agency to try to make this executive order work." But that's now, and that's coming right out of the president's climate change action plan. You can look at the at the details of this, this is the, these are the forest and forestry aspects inside that plan. <clears throat> now, if you haven't read it, because I mean, this is not the first thing you do when you pull up a Starbucks in the morning to read this stuff that comes out of DC. Okay, but embedded in that plan is our forest, forest management, wood, wood products, markets, and a lot of work went into putting that stuff there uh, behind the scenes. And you can give a lot of credit to a Duke grad here, uh, Robert Bonney, who's now our undersecretary uh, in uh, Natural Resources and Environment in USDA, who did a lot of work directly with the White House to bring forest and active management into this. So what he tried and what, what the, um, the group at CEQ has tried to do, what we always try to do, <coughs> is build forest into whatever policies so that then hopefully they can transcend administrations. <clears throat> we know that over time, most of us careerists are, are like, um, I don't want to even draw the analogy, let's just say we have survival ability. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and we go through w w waves of different ideas coming through as administrations go through. But if you follow and you are patient uh, and tenacious and sneaky enough, you can embed the mission 
in the ideas of each administration that comes in and make it work. So in trying to get Forrest as part of the solution into this administration's framework, I think we, Robert Bonney and others, have, have at least laid a foundation. Forrest were not being talked about when climate change was being talked about four, five years ago in the bigger, inside the beltway um, asylum, okay, that, that you all kind of read about in the papers. So our job was to get it positioned so when we talk about cutting carbon pollution, managing forests for better forest health and retain forest and forest is part of that solution. It's up to us to put numbers and put an analysis and policy platforms on it, but we're, and we're looking forward to that. We just, we just had to, that was the price of admission. Okay, when we talk about climate change response, we're not talking about a monolithic forest and a monolithic response. It has to be oriented to the combination of, of the, how the climate plays out in different areas, the different ownership patterns. When I, when I hear us talk about climate change a lot, we often talk about the nation's forest in a very broad sense. We don't go to the regional or the ownership pattern. So the solution for the private owners is different than the solution for public owners. And, and, and allowing that diversity is kind of the strength of the forest. The diversity of the ownerships and the diversity of the objectives create that portfolio strength of the forest itself. And it's what we try to preserve in what we're doing. And we're trying to build climate change in all the programs that are there. When I talked with the chief, when I took, took this job, I don't know, it must have been that second glass of wine or whatever, <laughs> <coughs> that we, we could not build another, we could not build a climate change stovepipe. One of the big issues in the, any organization, and Forest Service in particular, is that we've got big stovepipes that drive to the ground, that are budgeted individually, that have fixed cell walls, and you can't make them work. Silos. silos. They're silos, stovepipes. And then, they're, then, the, then the language actually gets more guttural than after that, you know, and describing <laughs> these things. So we did not want a climate change stovepipe. It was building an end to what we already do. And it takes longer to do that. Uh, but that's really what we've tried to do. And in each one of these deputy areas, we have programs that w which you can put climate considerations in. It takes a while to do that. It's taken us several years now and will continue to take time. One of the things that we've done is build it into the performance evaluation system of the agency so that every uh, forest supervisor, every regional forester, every station director has on their performance evaluation uh, performance on this climate change scorecard. So we tried to build you know, around 10 different elements here, what it would look like, how a f an agency would behave if they were gonna really build climate change into what they were doing. They would be building capacity up in this first block, developing partnerships under the second block, under the third, the third block at the bottom there, <clears throat> taking a systematic approach to managing the risk that we call adaptation, and in the fourth block, managing their own carbon footprint and the carbon in the forest. It's a simple thing, but to implement it across an agency with 150 national forests and 33,000 employees in that is, is where we're, our experience has been taking us. We're into three years of that now. So these are the results of 150 national forests, we have a coordinator, climate change coordinator in every national forest. The best, that the, the region, I can say this now and it's not in writing, so nobody's gonna roll me in a parking lot in the west, <clears throat> but the, uh, the region that's, done, that's made the most progress on this scorecard across all those is the southern region. So you can give them, them a hand. The southern station, the universities, the, the southern region have done a, a wonderful job of getting the science into the, practice, and that's what a lot of this evaluation system is about. Notice, though, that there are some areas where we're falling behind. So part of my job is to kind of our, run our No Forest Left Behind program. <laughs> <laughs> so we have these interesting visits that, I mean, I watch Godfather 1 and 2 over and over again, okay, and so I, I pick up these tips, you know. So we, we do these visits, you know, oh God, here comes Pigpen again with his visit, to try to understand what's holding them up. One of the big things that we're holding them up down under 
understanding, does this, does this point here? Oh my, yes, it works, okay. Um, under carbon assessment, it was, it was really given the National Forest System fits because they say, well, we've been managing trees and timber and wildlife habitat and watersheds for decades. Now you're telling us that you think we should be managing carbon. What does that mean? And this is not carbon for carbon markets. This is what we would call carbon plus. Forest carbon plus all those other ecosystem services in a bundle. And how do we do that? And how do we understand how much carbon that we have out there, where it's going, what can we do, how much does it cost in carbon terms to do the work that we have to do to get the other ecosystem services. It's a whole new dimension that we're bringing into operations here. So what we had to do uh, was to give them a booster shot. We had to go to our forest research folks at FIA and actually do a carbon assessment for every national forest over a 25-year period. So this gives them a profile where, where we've given them where their carbon, total ecosystem carbon is going, at least from FIA data, and it has some issues when you get to small forest and you don't have enough plots to have a low enough error term, but we've got them started with this pathway for carbon and we're doing an analysis now of the fluxes. What causes the, this carbon estate to have problems or to gain carbon <coughs> fast or slow? How, do you, how can you describe the profile of the carbon on your forest? Part of it was the scorecard. Part of it was because we have a White House who is influenced by agencies who think that if you're going to deal with carbon, you have to have regulation or you have to have disclosure of every project that you do in carbon terms. And our argument has been you need to look at car forest carbon from the appropriate scale, not every project is equivalent to a smokestack, but that you have to look at the ecosystem level or at least the total forest level to see what's happening. So we were trying to provide the information to the forest to be able to make that argument too. And <clears throat> to be able to respond to things at a landscape scale. Most of the agencies are really offering up to carbon or to uh, climate change management the landscape scale conservation approach that you can do more things you can manage risk in a more uh, systematic way if you do it at a large enough scale. And that means partners, that means uh, collaboration, that means a whole bunch of things. And we have not yet perfected uh, <clears throat> the practices of landscape scale conservation. W one good example of that in the South of, of actually doing a, a good job of that is the Longleaf Pine Alliance and the Longleaf Pine restoration <clears throat> work because you've identified a big scale problem, you've got big scale collaboration, you brought resources to the task. We're gonna, that's the scale at which we're gonna have to take on climate change in the future. <laughs> and we have to build the structure around it so that we do that. What we've found that when we went into the Forest Service uh, policy toolkit, the, it's not like a toolkit that comes to you from Sears shrink wrapped with an operating manual. <laughs> it's a whole bunch of tools going every which way and don't necessarily work with one another. So we have to do, we're, we're in the process of doing some, some inside work to try to build the ability to do landscape scale approaches to not just climate response, but to adaptation. So when we built the climate change roadmap and the scorecard, it was attached to the new planning rule. And the planning rule was attached to our proposals for putting multiple budget pieces together in one so we could be more flexible. So we, we've, we've got a lots of internal work to do. Okay, so how do we get here? We, we don't have the answer. We're on a journey and we're part way down the path. Okay, but we got here because a lot of folks did a lot of work and I, and I like to go to this model, John Kingdon's model, of how policies come about. You know, nobody ever asked the question, you know, like, mommy, where do policies come from? <laughs> you know, you get into a, I'd like to see the answer to that one, okay. Um, <laughs> you, you get into policies are uh, written on paper, and then you either follow them or you study them, but where do they come from? How do they come to be? 
what, were, what problems were really trying to be, were, were needed to be solved at the time that that suggestion for a policy came up. And there's, there, are very, there are not very many studies, except in history, uh, in, the, in the historical literature, of how policies came to be. What was, what was driving the, the decision-making machinery at the time? And Kingdon has done, I think, a great job of aligning three streams, not aligning necessarily all the time, but separating three streams. One is, how do you get the thing on the agenda? How do we get climate change or some piece of it on the agenda of the executive leadership team of the organization? <clears throat> People decide about what's on their agenda. People talk about what's on their agenda. If it's not on the agenda, if it's not on Congress's agenda or the administration's, it won't get talked about, it won't get decided about. Somebody has to make sure that it gets there. Somebody else, same person or perhaps another person, has to have some solutions, a proposal, advocacy, a policy entrepreneur, one or two or three of the others. We've got some, and you have some folks here, I don't know if, I haven't seen him in years, Bob Moulton. <clears throat> Remember Bob, Bob Moulton was, worked for the Forest Service, in the Washington office in the early years, and he was what I would call a policy entrepreneur. He was an economist, a practical economist, worked for state and private, and he, I thought, was a very effective at taking the science, building it into policy proposals, and making sure that it matched and fit with the agenda. He has even worked the agenda side of it, too. So, and, and there are lots of folks in these organizations, they're quiet, they don't get written up, but they're very effective in putting these things to together and following these, these three streams here. The other stream being the politics. <clears throat> you got to understand the pol political context. The best thing that could happen to Forest Service and climate change right now is not to go to Congress. <clears throat> <laughs> we go over when asked, but you go over, and we go over and brief the staffs because the staffs want to know. We do not get involved unless the chief gets involved in uh, political theater, because that's what it often ends up to be. And so, but we're, we try to educate the staff on what's going on in forest science and, and uh, forest management. So right now, we, we can make two of these streams work. The political stream, we can only make work on the administrative side. Someday, we may, we may be able to go back and make all three of them work and make some progress. So I think a lot of the, a lot of the message to young folks is, especially young folks, because some of us old folks get kind of jaded about this thing. So, you know, well, you still got energy, you still got optimism and enthusiasm and all those other things, you know. Uh, <laughs> gather some patience, too. <laughs> And because these things are going to go underground for a while and then they come back up and ideas are going to cycle. So over a long sweep of history here, the, you, you know, you may be discouraged because this idea doesn't work, like ecosystem services and our ability to quantify it and use it in decision making. Just keep after it. Just keep after it. Because you'll, eventually you'll find one of these windows where two or three of those, poly, those streams come together and you can run through those windows and make something happen. Uh, here's kind of a, the bigger sweep of history of climate change in the Forest Service. It can be anybody's history, really. Uh, it's several decades old. This is not a new thing. I want to point, uh, especially in before 1990, the tremendous amount of work that went into the science side of forest management and the core environmental policies that we will put climate change response on, whether it's you know, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, the National Forest Management Act, the uh, NEPA, whatever you think about those, that is the, that's the skeleton, that is the, 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 uh, the ironworks, if you will, on which responses to climate are going to be placed. So I don't think that there are going to be that many more new climate change policies. They're going to be attached to those. And, and, and a lot of the experience we had with the National Atmospheric Deposition Assessment Program and other big programs gave the communities, uh, scientific communities and management communities, the confidence to take on big issues. 
Okay, so when we went from NAPAP into climate change, there was, there was enough understanding that, yeah, we can think through some of these big issues and take them on. We don't have to be concerned only with issues at a fine scale or at a region or at a forest or wherever scale. So I th and, and that was a kind of a training ground for taking on climate change. In the 90s, things opened up, <coughs> uh, so to speak, um, and a number of different policies were passed that allowed us to deal with climate change, Climate Change Research Act on coordination, the Climate Change Prevention Act that set up things like our urban forestry program or international forestry program and others. People don't generally don't recognize that, that that came out of a big discussion on climate change. And, um, and I passed around this, or we passed around this uh, timeline there that kind of outlines in detail. And if you, that's in draft form, and if you see things in there that are wrong or that you think should be added, please send those to me because I, I, I find in putting that together, it kind of helps keep our memory clean. <clears throat> things kind of flow into one another and you start and memory starts being a creative process, not a recollection process, <clears throat> you know, and you bring it forward into a decision process with some mythologies and some fantasies that you think are going to support a decision, and they're not really there at all. The sequence matters. So I think um, uh, in, the, in the 2000s, it was a lot of emphasis on carbon and carbon markets, and there was a lot of what I would call carbon envy. <clears throat> where uh, private landowners in particular, rightfully so, were looking at ways to diversify their operation and get markets for carbon, and we are almost there. We were, we were there about to about 2009, a little into 2009, Waxman, Waxman Markey, and there was a lot of discussion about a national carbon market. We had some bipartisan agreement on this, and then recession hit, then we had the health care laws passed and some of the divisions that, were, that occurred because of that. The next thing you know, climate change and cap and trade became one of the labeling, one of the labels and boom, boom, it just went away. The champions for it went away. It's not gone forever. I think it will come back when we get some way to put a price on carbon, whether it's a tax or whatever. I don't know how long that's going to, that's going to be, but I think all the work that went into that can be brought out, and the Nicholas School did a lot of work, can be brought out when we get to that point. So again, don't throw, it's the old ecology thing, don't throw away the parts, any of the parts. The intellectual parts that we generated, I think, are still going, going to be helpful. Uh, but we shifted in about 2010 to more of an adaptation focus. It finally dawned on <coughs> the administration and others that, that we were accumulating all this evidence of the impacts of climate change, and we needed to take care of that too because we've got committed warming in the system that will last us probably another 150 years if we cut off uh, <coughs> CO2 of, to, um, uh, emissions today. I mean, it's in the system, it's working, it's a business, it's an ecological, it's a whole set of other propositions we're going to have to deal with. Adaptation is just as important, and I think that's where, that's where we've gone just, in, just recently. Let me give you a, a look at the uh, 1990 amendment. If you think we, this, this thing just turned around yesterday, 1990 amendment to the RPA said, yeah, it's, what is that, 23, 24 years ago, that we need to start looking at climate change in our long-range assessments, in this case, the Resource Planning Act assessment. <coughs> So this is kind of how I see our history through the th most recent chiefs. We kind, of, we kind of mark time in the Forest Service through chief years. <laughs> I'm going to have to tell. I, I sit down every two weeks and, and brief the chief on things. I've never told him that he's part of a chief year. <laughs> I better be really careful or, or, or go back and rework my retirement calculator. <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> Uh, anyway, so, but each of the last three chiefs, and the chiefs before them and their administrations brought lots of other things like ecosystem management and, and, uh, and, and, and other elements for responding to climate change, but it wasn't really about climate change response. The last three chiefs have actually dived into this. Bosworth in, uh, Dale Bosworth 
started connecting climate change to what he was calling the four threats, which include fire and invasives and even unmanaged recreation, and I can't, oh, I, and it was loss of forest land, <clears throat> okay? Then he said, well, this is getting to be a downer. I'm going around talking about the threats all the time, and the big issue is the changing climate. How are we gonna get this on the agenda? So he gave a speech at the Centennial, the uh, Forest Service Centennial, uh, and introduced co um, climate change as one of the big conservation challenges. Gail Kimball, who, who followed <coughs> Dale Bosworth, took on climate change as one of the top priorities and attached it to water. <clears throat> that we've got some issues, and especially, you know, you see it in our Organic Act, the National Forest System is set up to actually manage forested watersheds, among other things. Climate change is influencing that hydrologic cycle and the, and the health of the forest. We've got big problems in the future in, the, in providing the water that we say we should be providing. So that was her approach, and she also brought in the concept of biomass and bioenergy as a climate change tool, and we're still arguing about that one. That is really, uh, that's, that's the, the, the lost 40 minutes of sleep each night on, not on that issue, and I can get into that separately. And then Tidwell, Tom Tidwell, he set up the climate change office, worked climate change into the new planning rule, big arguments about how prominent climate change should be in the planning rule. I argued against making it prominent in the planning rule. Again, we need to keep working it in. We don't want to organize a planning rule around climate change. So we had big arguments inside and outside with the environmental groups on that one. I still think we're, we're right. And then trying to con work the concept of restoration around climate savvy, climate smartness. <clears throat> on, throughout all this, the research program of the Forest Service has been the foundation. You are part of that through our partnerships with you at Duke and all the other universities uh, and other, uh, other partners. And what worries me the most about now and in the future is our inability to reinvest in the research piece. <clears throat> if you look at the FIA program, when the 1990 Climate Change Prevention Act came about and some of the money from NAPAP went into um, climate change. Rich Birdsey from the FIA program said, how in the heck are we gonna keep track of this carbon? The best thing we've got is FIA. It wasn't completely set up for the forest inventory analysis program to do it, and we still have lots of problems in being able to measure across all those pools of carbon, but at least it was a start, and that's where he went because we had put in good, solid work over time. So my, my major issue about science is that if you look at this graph, this is just what we've pulled out as what we call a climate change crosscut. And if you look at the inflation adjusted numbers, which is the bottom piece, it's essentially flat. And if you look at the two bump ups and bump downs, those are political perturbations. I had, to, I had to use that word because I learned it once. Um, anyway, <laughs> in 95 was when we had the first shutdown showdown. And what followed from that was a, quite a suspicion of government and a real whack at the Forest Service and on all the research programs in general because it didn't appear to be, it didn't appear to be producing impacts on the ground, among other things. So this reflects a bigger bump down in Forest Service research in general in 95 that we've never really recovered. So before 95, we had 900, close to 900 uh, scientists, research panel grade scientists. Now we've got 458 or something like that. So we never have really recovered from that. And then we made a mistake, I don't want to say it's a mistake, but we, we had an unfortunate turn of events political events in the 2010 budget where we were asked to do a cross cut and call it climate change. So we dutifully did that. And as soon as it went over to the Congress, they whacked it because that turnover had occurred at just that time and the House in particular did not like anything that had climate change attached to it. Although most of it was not climate research, it was forest research under a climate influence, which, and there's a lot, little do they know, there's a whole hell of a lot of other research going on that has a 
it has a climate uh, piece to it, and it's important that we do that work. It's just not called climate change research. So I think that, that keeping that, um, keeping that foundation solid and growing is important. And I think for the entire research community, not just the Forest Service, I think we've got some real <coughs> issues in being able to present forest, excuse me, forest research and climate research in a coordinated way and with a uniform message to both the administration and Congress so that we are competitive with the other fields. When we had the 1990, uh, excuse me, the 2009, I'm sorry, um, stimulus package, the ARRA, some of the agencies, Department of Energy in particular, made hay in their research program by pushing through a, a big research package <coughs> in that. The natural resource community, with the exception of maybe the climate science centers and, and USGS, did not do as well because I frankly think we weren't as organized across the research brand, or the research activities, not just Forest Service, but universities and others, and we were probably a little too meek. We should, we, we should have stepped forward and made a stronger case. So um, anyway, so, so where are we going? We're gonna have to take care of the carbon, the forest carbon. And Jamie, you got, I don't know what, but I guess there's some folks gonna come in here. Are we, are we okay? Okay. We got, oh, I see. This is like a, like a siege thing. Is that, okay. Oh, this is going to be fun. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so we got, we, got to, we got to deal with this forest carbon future thing. We're at a transition. We have a forest, a nation's forest, that's actually a resource. It's actually in fairly good shape for a number of different reasons, conservation, management, uh, We've been building up we, we have a few recessions. <laughs> you name it, we got a lot of carbon on the hoof there. We offset about um, anywhere from 12 to 15 percent of the rest of the, of the fossil fuel emissions every year. And the CEQ and the president's office thinks that's a good thing, except that they take us for granted. They haven't done anything. So all of a sudden, when the Resource Planning Act projections came out, and Dave Ware and, and Linda Langner and all the other folks in the, the, the part of the RPA assessment have been like working this thing for the last six months. When these, when these projections came out, they showed that we are likely to move from becoming a net sink where we're offsetting the emissions from fossil fuels sources to a net source, that is, if we don't start stop losing forest land to urbanization, if we don't stop losing carbon to fires and bugs and other disturbances, the forest themselves need to, if, if the forest themselves, uh, given the objectives of the owner, aren't managed better so that the growth rates stay where they are rather than become over mature, <clears throat> we're gonna have a situation where the forest itself becomes a net source and we're gonna have to worry about it, worry about it perhaps from being regulated. We've been, we've been, in, we've been kind of the, the heroes so far, kind of quiet heroes. So this has set in motion a whole bunch of discussions about <clears throat> how are you gonna manage this? The National Climate Assessment that Jim Vos and others uh, and Dave Peterson and about 40 other authors put together show that, hey, this isn't about just climate change. This is about a climate-driven risk profile that varies over time and space, and that we have to manage this because this is part of what's driving losses in carbon, emissions of carbon into the air. So we might have a lot of carbon, but as you remember those graphs up there on the National Forest System, how it was growing, how much of that carbon is at increasing risk? How do you manage the risk to the carbon and have a more stable carbon base and how do you work through all those decisions about management which incurs a short-term carbon emission, a loss, in exchange for a longer-term stability of carbon. So there's lots of interesting discussions about that and the impacts on ecosystem services like water. And what we're taking to the administration in the future is that we think that uh, a policy platform for the future of the forest 
if they want to talk about carbon or if they want to talk about other ecosystem services and adaptation, consist of three major actions. <clears throat> Keeping forest in forest, that is retaining them, restoring their health, not restoring them backwards necessarily, unless that counts, but actually restoring them forward, restoring the functions to some condition, and it may be restoring them to a forest that's going to be there in the future. Okay, and there's some heart-wrenching dis discussions and decisions to be made there, but in some cases, on the edges of these uh, systems as they move, it may be restoring to something new, which is kind of a conflict in terms. And then, and then reforesting. We are, just in the National Forest System, we only anymore reforest about 60,000 acres a year in the entire system. We think that we have about a million and a half acres of forest that need to be reforested because they have followed fires and other uh, large-scale disturbances, and they're not going to necessarily regenerate on their own that well. So in other words, we, we have a delay and we have a quality problem that's going to keep us out of the carbon and other ecosystem services game for a long enough period of time. So the re reforestation, the restoration, and the retention. Retention is largely a private lands issue, <clears throat> and our discussions with CEQ is, goes along the lines of, hey, if you're a private landowner, and we've got 11 million private landowners in the U.S., what does the policy fabric that surrounds your options tell you about how, how feasible it is to do active forest management. If you've got some real screwy uh, tax incentive, that's, that's a t technical term, <coughs> or tax disincentives that doesn't allow you to stretch out your planning horizon or that are confusing or they're conflicting, you are actually detracting from our ability to retain forest as forest. This, is, this piece right here is where most of the uh, RPA climate carbon projection um, impact comes from. It's just losing forest land to other uses. Because when you lose it, you emit not only what the sequestration potential, but you emit then what was there that you stored up over all the years. And the forest of the U.S. store about 30, mil, um, 30 years worth of total fossil fuel emissions for the whole country in just the stock. So if you start losing that stock, you're losing <coughs> a lot of carbon. So this is the argument that we're continuing to take. We think that, that we need a, I don't, I don't want to stop, stop short of calling it a national forest, a nation's forest policy, but we certainly need some work to align policies. If they want to talk about carbon and they want to go off and do their n negotiations, then <clears throat> these are the measures, sets of measures that we're asking. And it's not just about mitigation. If you're doing retention and restoration and reforestation, you have a mitigation and an adaptation bump. You get benefits from both. You can't really separate them. When it comes to the forest, you can't have <coughs> uh, a stable and growing carbon source unless you have a well-adapted, healthy forest. Okay, so what have we learned? <clears throat> As we take a big issue into an organization and you analyze the issue, you said, oh, why in the hell did I do this? What was I thinking? Why did I take this on? I could be fishing now. Okay. <laughs> and there, and, and there are, and, and as, as an issue, climate change was not ready for prime time because it's really big. It's ideologically charged. It has a number of uncertainties. Oh, I think we, we really make a mistake by focusing on the uncertainties. There's more certainty in what we see in the climate change evidence than in many, many other fields. But we focus on the uncertainty. So I think we can make some changes in our communication. But I think what we also do, and I see myself doing it, and I gotta be careful, is that we make climate change a kind of a distant and apocalyptic issue. It's gonna happen. It's, and, if, and when it happens, you're gonna get your due. You know, so we throw a little personal in there. And it so reminds me, of, it's so damn parental. You know, and, you know, I go back to, oh my God, I can hear my father. You know, um, it, it, because his, his, his view was not trial and error, it was error and trial. You commit an error and you go on trial. 
Okay. So we, we ha it has that, that kind of a feel to it, and I think there are so many, there are probably a whole lot of opportunities in a changing climate that we haven't really recognized or communicated yet. We've got some forests that are, whose growth is going to be boosted by CO2, and some of the work that you all have done here on the face site and others have, have shown you know, some of those potentials. The Canadians, when they meet with us, they say, bring it on. We're happy to get your species up here. We'd love to get your wine industry up here. Come up and visit us in about 50 years. <laughs> To, to which I have a, a typical Yankee reply. Okay, so, but if you trot this over into an organizational challenge, these are the things we had to, we're having to wrestle with. Translation issues, issues across functions that really don't fit together or, or don't fit separately anymore, um, a certain amount of political caution, and what we get from the interest groups is that they want to keep fighting the last war. The, the industry and the environmental communities, at least the extremes of those, want to attach the last war. They want to bring the problems of the spotted owl uh, back to the climate change issue and attach to it. And we have to keep saying, hey, this is a new issue. This is not just about the fight that you've been fighting the whole, whole time. And it was the different use of what they used to call the precautionary principle, where it may no longer be the, when you're uncertain, you don't do anything. In this case, when you're uncertain, maybe you need to do something and learn about it. So it's a different, a different approach. Um, and we have to always be concrete because it can tend to be quite abstract. People in organizations, of course, want to be concrete. OK, a few uh, lessons here that at least these are mine. So you can, although this is, oh, this is on, that's right, it's filmed, isn't it? Oh, I'm, I'm dead meat. OK. <laughs> OK, this is what. I've learned on my summer vacation and my shutdown vacation. Okay, <laughs> although I wasn't supposed to be working, and I and I um, walked the dog to the point the dog won't talk to me anymore and just runs, <laughs> and and mowed the lawn to the point of compaction, and then so I think so I got so now I had to go back to work and kind of surreptitiously. So I was as I was thinking through this, what did we learn? Um, you know, you got a big decentralized organization. But that doesn't that mean that it's only decentralized physically. The, you can bring a very decentralized organization together morally with what Kaufman called moral centralization. Pinchot did it when he started the outfit. He trained them all, plied them with liquor. You know, if you ever read some of the history of the Yale Forestry School, you'd wonder, whoa, whoa, it's like Animal House or something. And, 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 but it sent them out with a very clear mission and sets of expectation to wherever they went. And Kaufman has always, um, Kaufman, who did the study of the forest ranger, has did a, a later set of studies, a revisitation of the forest ranger study in administrative behavior and talked about moral centralization, the idea of the, if the mission's clear enough and people are bound together, they can be all over the world. It doesn't, doesn't matter. So I think part of that is trying to capture some of that value of moral centralization. That's why I work so much on the leadership and why I have some issues in the signals that they send. We have a mission that's entirely consistent with dealing with climate change. I don't think there's anything wrong with the mission. It's how we implement it. Where we do have problems is staying alert because people, and you'd think that the forestry org a forestry organization would want to lean into things in the future. I mean, we. You know, forestry is the kind of the future thing, right? You plant a tree, it's, it's an act of faith in the future, okay? But we, sometimes we have uh, problems in staying alert to emerging issues. And the Resource Planning Act assessment was really set up to do that, to look out ahead, to use the best science to create a set of headlights, to look out there and say, what do we think is coming and how, do we, and how can we go to work on this early so that we minimize the cost and the disruption and the impact? Sometimes it really is difficult to get, to, to get that in front of people. Uh, assumptions die hard. 
Uh, in some cases, uh, the best approach is a kind of a genetic approach <coughs> where, I mean, there's, there's nothing better, and somebody told me this one time just not too long ago, and I kind of took it personally, nothing better than a well-placed retirement. <coughs> okay, so some of, these, some of these attitudes kind of leave with the people and new attitudes come in. That's why I'm so excited. I don't, I don't think I've ever been more optimistic about the forest service and the forestry sector because of the young people that are coming in. Bringing their new ideas, bringing their new energy, you know, it's, it's time. And, and so I think that's, that's where some of these rituals leave us. So don't take everything for granted. That's, that's just the way it is. And that sto we talked about stovepiped and silos, big issues. I think the forest service has the <clears throat> architecture where it has three deputy areas, state and private, national forest system, R&D, under one roof. You do not find that in any other agency in, in the federal government. We need to use that more to advantage. We, and, and I don't think we are, partly because of the stovepipe things, because we get competition among the deputy areas. We used to do a lot more uh, what we call research development and applications programs where all three deputy areas would put money into a big program to solve a problem. An example of that these days, an exception to that, and an example of that is the uh, Eastern Threat Assessment Center, which is that kind of an arrangement where it's jointly funded and they, they have kind of a center for disease control model of dealing with forest health. But I think we need to do more of that. We're not, we're not doing that as much as we could. And as we look forward, especially to the young folks, here are some questions that I think you're going to be dealing with. Can you build a viable market for sequestration? California's got one. <clears throat> we don't know yet how big of a part the forestry is going to play in it, forests are going to play in it. Can we do what we tried to do in 2007, 8, and 9 on a national scale? Can we help stakeholders change their expectations about the forest that they're used to seeing and being a part of. We have a, I think we have a big role ahead of us, the forestry sector, not just the forest service, in leading what I would call civic discovery. It's the, it's the process of bringing people into futures that they might have to deal with and getting them prepared to maybe have a different forest than they had before or different set of forest ecosystems. We've got a different kind of leadership there that we, that we need. And can we pull the science and the management together to create innovations? And that includes the private sector. Can we turn science around and put it into innovations and get it on the ground and learn from it and bring it back into the science so that we're doing relative science? Can we, and we hook that cycle up better than it's hooked up now so that we don't have these disjunctures. We're going to have to be a lot more agile about bringing science to solutions than we have in the past. And then can we, um, can we keep forest management, active forest management, or let's just say science-based forest management, as part of the climate change solution? I think we can, but it's going to take a lot of folks to keep it, to get it lifted and to keep it lifted. <clears throat> okay, Final, finally, Here's some reflections on, from an administrator. Okay, a broken down administrator, recovering economist, you know, whatever <laughs> you want to call me. That, and economics has actually been, and decision science has actually been so useful. The two, the two bundles of, of um, knowledge, I guess you could say, that I rely on most is that the economics thinking where you can really effectively become a pain in the butt, <clears throat> you know, in decision processes that may be going wrong, okay? And then the work that I was lucky enough to be a part of at Oregon State in extension, because a lot of what I do now is take complex um, processes and concepts and take them into a form where I can educate leadership, where I can educate some members of the Forest Service, where I can educate an interest group that comes in. It's really, although we don't call it extension, the skills of taking that complex information, and even if it's a five-minute session, is an educational session. And so I, 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 I go back a lot to the seven years I spent at Oregon State. Part of it was spent in extension because 
<clears throat> you're, you're, t you're taking it to people who don't know the first thing about it. And so, so I, this, that's kind of how I come at these questions. Um, I think there's a lot of history floating around that's not been written. There's a lot of history in these agencies walking out the door. In both cases, history means knowledge. And so I think what we need to be able to do is ask the right questions of the right people. And if you're a staffer that comes into an organization, spend some time asking questions of people, especially the ask loud questions of quiet people. <clears throat> because the, sometimes the quiet folks, you always have the flamboyant folks, you know, and they always get the attention and, you know, God. <clears throat> but a lot of times the quiet people, especially the ones that have been around a while, have really deep and they, they know what's going on. They don't, the taboos in the organizational culture doesn't allow that to come out sometimes. And if they, you, if they get opened up, my God, you get an education in a hurry. And I think, I think a lot of times our quiet people have, who have been kind of kingpins, really, in some of this change that pops out as policy sometime, never get asked. Well, I don't know, you never ask me, you know. And all of a sudden, you go to their retirement party, and that's the last time you see them. They're gone. <clears throat> They're out in a boat somewhere, out on the golf course or whatever. Uh, we need to understand context, intent, and sequence, not just what's written down. How did we get here? Who's in who did it? What was the intent? Did we get there where we actually wanted to be with this policy or with this move, or did something go wrong somewhere? We need to ask those kind of questions. It's all about reframing the problem. If you ever watch the, uh, <clears throat> the Sunday shows, the talk shows, which I watch less and less of these days, um, and look at Washington in general, it is a town of reframers. <clears throat> they, they, it's not as much kind of open, direct communication as it is, I've got what I want, and when you ask me a question, I'll reframe it so I can answer it. I didn't necessarily answer your question, but I, re I reframed it. So I think we have to be very aware of how problems are framed in communications so that we know what we're actually answering or what we want to take into the policy framework. I think extreme events are opportunities. And was it Rahm Emanuel said, you know, why, why, waste, a, why waste a perfectly good um, crisis? And most of the really good policy operators and entrepreneurs know that when you have an extreme event, there's an opportunity. It may be tragedy, it may be loss. And if you look at, uh, one example of that is, was the National Fire Plan. In 2000, we had a really bad fire year. And what happens after every bad fire year? I call it the winner of our discontent. It's, 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 when, it's when the political system wants to help. And if you know that, and that's what happened in that two, after the 2000 fire year, the agencies got together. And the next thing you know, they had what it was a like two billion dollar bump, I believe, in dollars for fire management, including a 26 billion, 26 million dollar increase in research on fire. Overnight, I was there, 15 minute conversation. Three months later, we, we put $26 million in place in the, in the, in the R&D. Now, that's not to say, don't, I mean, don't do that at home. <laughs> don't try that, or I mean, you'll, you'll never live. But I mean, and I'm not saying that everything was, that I would do it over again, or do it over in the same way. But what I'm saying is we had a number of people who saw that policy window and had enough of a plan that they could run through it at that time because of an extreme event. So I think some of these extreme events actually give us some opportunities to actually make some changes we've been wanting to make. And then don't, don't, don't confuse what you, what you see in hindsight with what a decision maker has to consider in foresight. <clears throat> it's a tricky process to move from hindsight, which has its biases, into a decision making process, which is all about the future and how to, how to evaluate these different levels and types of uncertainty. Certainly a lot to be learned, but just don't assume. It's so, it's so easy to Monday morning, morning quarterback decisions, but if you're in the middle of them, a lot of this is out in the windshield and it's kind of cloudy out there. It's pretty foggy.
It's not as certain as if seeing it later. And then last, um, you got a lot of folks in these agencies, I think, in these organizations and these companies who have been there a long time and they've kind of been desensitized as a survival mechanism, perhaps. <clears throat> and, and, and so they've seen a lot of changes and they kind of take a, I've been there, done that, don't go there. And we really, us, us um, more seasoned individuals, <clears throat> need to quell our urge to say that because the young folks in particular are seeing opportunity and they might be able to punch through that window where we weren't. So we, we don't need to, to take our views and sometimes jaded views and, and quell the enthusiasm of the young folks. I think we need to encourage that. So anyway, that's, that's, those are all the remarks I had and I'll be happy to answer questions.